In just a week's time, on Monday, February 6th, we'll be, we'll be hosting our annual Atlas Award. This year promises to be, this is an annual event, but this year promises to be an especially moving one as we welcome home the U.S. troops from Iraq and Afghanistan. Excuse me, I'm left-handed. And, uh, uh, and, excuse me, and I also acknowledge those staying on in Afghanistan. Our featured speaker will be General Peter Pace, the 16th Chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff and Chairman of the Wall Street Warfighters Foundation. On February 22nd, we will welcome Trudy Rubin, Foreign Affairs columnist at the Philadelphia Inquirer, a senior political analyst at Al Jazeera for an update one year after the Arab Spring. For details on Eye of the Economy series, as well as for our April visit, the former Prime Minister Tony Blair, please refer to our website on our most recent newsletter, which is available at the registration table, as you may have noticed on your way in. Your membership, membership and participation in the World Affairs Program entitles, excuse me, enables us to offer our highly regarded global education programs to a diverse group of over 2,100 middle and high school students in 80 schools throughout the Philadelphia area, fostering the skills they will need in order to thrive and compete in a knowledge-based global economy. We do have a number of students with us this evening. If uh, I could just ask you to stand up for a minute, and uh, everyone want to give a round of applause. They're still learning, so. <laughs> now for the real topic at hand. Unfortunately, Larry Broder, the former New York Times South American Bureau Chief, was called away on a last minute assignment. However, I'm delighted to welcome Al Weitzman to the Council's podium this, e this evening. Mr. Weitzman is currently the Financial Times Chicago and Midwest correspondent. He has been on the staff of the Financial Times since 2000, not the New York Times. There is a, a, a copy over there as well for those of you who would like a complimentary copy. Mm -hmm. He first joined us as an editor on its op-ed desk, was named America's News Editor in 2002 and was the newspaper's Andes Bureau Chief from 2004 to 2007. While based in Lima, he traveled extensively, reporting from Peru, Bolivia, Ecuador, Venezuela, and Chile. <coughs> in addition to the Financial Times, his reporting from the region also appeared in several publications, including the Los Angeles Times, the Miami Herald, New Statesman, and the Irish Times. Originally from Wales, of course I mistaked him for England, Mr. Weitzman was educated at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, Oriel College, Oxford, and Leeds University. We are delighted to have him here with us this evening. If you would please join me in welcoming. Well, thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you to the World Affairs Council for uh, putting on this event. I have to say I'm overwhelmed by the interest in Latin America. Normally, it's, you have to beat people's head with a blunt object to get them to, uh, to listen to, to you talking about South America. Just excuse me a second, I'm just going to get uh, my props out here. So, um, so I want to start off with, uh, with a question. And here it is. Could it be that the United States needs Latin America more than Latin America needs the United States. Now, think back uh, a little over a decade ago. The United States was the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. The most powerful country economically, politically, militarily. Why on earth would it need anyone? let alone a continent known for its periodic economic crises, its political instability, and for having almost no global political influence. Well, how times have changed. And how used we have become to them changing. There's an old uh, Jewish joke set in 18th century Eastern Europe at a time when, when the borders were changing very rapidly, when countries were kind of asserting their sovereignty over disputed tracts of land. And so the story goes that a, a woman is, is pegging up washing 
in some remote shtetl somewhere. And a Cossack soldier rides up. The soldier declares, Old woman, from this day forth, this land is no longer Poland. It is Imperial Russia. And he rides off. And the woman watches him go and she says, Thank God, I couldn't stand another Polish winter. <laughs> Like the old woman in that story, or the woman in that story, we have become used to the tectonic plates of global power and influence shifting beneath our feet. We hear time and again that America is in decline. America is going through something now that's akin to a midlife crisis, something about which unfortunately I'm getting to know all too well. I'm going to be 40 in March, and uh, you know America. America's got an ever-expanding debt burden and a receding global role. I've got an expanding waistline and a receding hairline. <laughs> we all have our problems, but America's going through a kind of deep existential angst. Its uh, its political institutions are discredited and broken. Its economy is still deeply wounded and suffering under an enormous, unwieldy debt burden. The Occupy movement and the Tea Party are calling into question the very foundations of American society. Americans are becoming insular, cautious and unsure about the process of globalization itself. The very process that the United States has been promoting for decades around the world as a means to achieve free societies, free markets. And this has provoked a sort of forlorn sense of nostalgia in America. Just look at, at the titles of some of the best-selling political books of the past year. Books like Republic Lost, The Unmaking of America, and that used to be us. That used to be us. What a pathetically sad and plaintive title that is. It sort of reminds me of my wife and me sitting on the couch, you know, looking at photos of when we were first dating. You know, she says to me, oh, you were quite handsome then. <laughs> <laughs> that you, how, how do you respond to that? <laughs> but the ultimate go underhand. That used to be us. That used to be us. I think, and I'm an outsider, so this is my observation, that Americans are becoming weary of this gloominess. It's very un-American, actually. And I think people want to know what's next. How do we get out of the rut that we're in? And there are two elements to this. One is the home front. And this is the one that we've all heard so much about. What do we do here at home to get America back on track? And of course, that's the ground over which the presidential election is going to be fought. And it's, these are very substantial, significant issues. You know, what, what is the role of the state in the economy? What is the nature of government? And the great and the good have all weighed in on them, and you've heard a lot about that. But an issue that we've heard a lot less about is the question, what is America's role in a multipolar world? How can America use its influence and its power in a world where it's no longer top dog? And that's really the question that I was trying to answer or trying to address in this book. In 2004, the Financial Times sent me to, to Peru. I was working in London. They sent me to exile in Peru to, to be their uh, grandly titled Andes correspondent, probably the best title in journalism, Andes correspondent for the Financial Times. And I would be lying if I told you that there were great expectations about what I was going to produce when I got there. You know, I, I ended up reporting from Venezuela, but 
when I was first sent out, my, my assignment was to cover Peru, Peru in the blue, <coughs> Bolivia in the green, and Ecuador in the purple. These aren't exactly the countries that you see on the front page of the newspaper, right? So I had a very memorable um, sort of debrief interview with one of the senior editors at the FT. He called me into his office. He said, you know, you've got a great story here. You've got Chavez, you've got the oil industry. I said, no, I'm not actually covering uh, Venezuela. He said, oh. Well, you've got, you've got the FARC, you know, you've got the war on drugs. I said, no, I'm not actually covering Colombia. <laughs> he said, oh, well, what, what are you actually covering? I said, you know, I'm doing Peru, Bolivia, and Ecuador. It was a very long pause. <laughs> and then he said, hmm, well, go and get a suntan. <laughs> And I took that advice to heart. But as it turned out, there was a huge amount of very important stuff that happened when I was there. I was lucky to have that most important thing that all journalists need, which is timing. Six months after I got there, the government in Ecuador was pushed out. Six months after that, the government in Bolivia was pushed out. And Evo Morales, a, a left-wing, firebrand nationalist, was elected president. And within six months, he had nationalized the gas industry. And six months after that, Rafael Correa, another left-wing nationalist, was elected in president in Ecuador. And in the meantime, another left-wing nationalist called Ollanta Humala was almost elected president of Peru. And for those of you who followed the region will know that he subsequently became president of Peru last year. So it was an incredibly exciting time and actually, I did make the front page quite a few times. But after going through all this reporting, these wonderful experiences, I said to myself, you've got to write a book about this. But it wasn't until the FT sent me to Chicago to be the Chicago correspondent that the book really came together. And I had a complete picture of what I wanted to say. Because I left a continent that had been booming and thriving. And I came to a country where, within a year, it was plunged into this deep economic crisis from which we're still you know, struggling, dealing with. And um, I'm just going to remind myself what I wanted to say next. For a long time, people who write and think and write about Latin America have, have argued that the United States needs to re-engage re with the region. But the, the premise of that argument has always been that Latin America needs to be rescued. It needs to be saved by the United States. I say in the book that Latin America is sort of cast as sleeping beauty. The United States is the prince who, if only he could be bothered to cut through the weeds, could kiss the region back to life. And in the eyes of, of several high-profile writers about Latin America, whom you may know, the region became the lost continent, or the forgotten continent. Interesting terms. I mean, the forgotten continent it kind of depends on where you're sitting. You know, there's a kind of an assumption there that because Latin America was forgotten in Washington, it was the forgotten continent. Well, it wasn't forgotten in Beijing, or in Moscow, or in Tehran. And as for being lost, you could argue that it was the United States that was lost. A, co a country, a superpower, unsure of how to use its power in an ever-changing world. But with the U.S. now in decline, what it really needs is alliances with new partnerships with new countries. Most importantly, countries in the emerging markets that are playing more a greater and greater role in the global economy. Now, America's big multinational companies, some of which I now cover uh, as the FT Chicago correspondent, long ago learned the lesson that they needed to invest 
in emerging markets. And if you look at the performance of some of the biggest companies in this country over the past few years, they thank their lucky stars that they have the prescience to invest in emerging markets because their growth in the United States and other developed economies has been pretty, pretty meager. A lot of companies have depended for their profits on sales uh, and demand in emerging economies. But the US government has been a lot slower to recognize um, the opportunities that globalization presents. And something that really struck me when I came from South America to North America was how few people had noticed the dichotomy between the economic performance of the US and the economic performance of Latin America. So across a whole range of measures, the trajectories we're going in entirely opposite directions. US growth, economic growth, I mean, was sluggish, occasionally flat. Latin America was booming. US unemployment was stubbornly high. In Latin America, joblessness was coming down. The United States was groaning under this enormous and ever-expanding debt burden. Latin American countries have paid off their debts, or were paying off their debts. <clears throat> Poverty and inequality was getting worse in the United States, stretching back to long before the financial crisis. And in Latin America, poverty rates were coming down. The American middle class feels increasingly squeezed under attack. In Latin America, millions of people are entering the middle class. The United States Seem to, have a, seem to be plagued by self-doubt, almost afraid of the future. For Latin America, they've never been more self-confident, and the future couldn't come quick enough. And none of this, of course, means that Latin Americans are wealthier than Americans. Of course not. There's a huge gap still. But the gap is narrowing, and the trajectories are clear. And of course, that's not just true of Latin America, it's true of all emerging markets. And that means that we have to get used to a world where emerging markets take a bigger and bigger share of the global economy. Now, of course, that's already happening. And one of the props I wanted to show you was my own paper, the FT, from December the 2nd. <coughs> So there's the front page of the FT, and the headline is, Brazilian growth shudders to a halt. The first thing, reason this fascinated me is, Brazil is the lead story in the leading financial newspaper of the world. I mean, that's incredible. It shows you how important Brazil is to the global economy. But obviously the meaning of the headline, Brazil growth shudders to a halt, indicates that it's not a linear process. You know, there will be years when the United States grows as fast as Latin America or other emerging markets. Maybe it will even go faster. I mean, this year is actually quite a good example. So this year, the United States is forecast to grow at about 3%. And Brazil is forecast to grow only slightly faster, about 4%. But you wouldn't bet on that for the long term, right? For the long term, you would assume that emerging economies are going to play a bigger and bigger role in the global economy. They're going to become more and more important. We're going to hear more and more about them. They're going to take up more and more headlines in the FT, in the Wall Street Journal, and The Economist. Uh, there was a, uh, a study I saw a few weeks ago by PwC, the consultants. And it was one of these fascinating projections where they, they show you what will be the top economies in 2050? And one of the interesting things from the, from the study is that they predict the United States will grow pretty healthily. So they say that between now and 2050, the US is going to grow by two and a half times. The economy is going to grow by two and a half times. Not, not, a, not a shoddy uh, achievement. But Brazil is going to grow by three and a half times. So it's the relative rate of growth that we're talking about. 
That, of course, is not only true of Brazil, it's true of all emerging markets, which is why it would be no surprise to any of us that in that PwC survey, the top two countries in the world by 2050 will be um, China and India. So America needs new partners. America needs new partners, particularly among the emerging markets. And in the book, I argue that there is no more natural partner for the United States than Latin America. I mean, the United States has on its doorstep one of the most lively, most dynamic emerging regions in the world. Why wouldn't it want to couple its economy and its society, its politics, with those countries? This isn't just a question of geography. I mean, socially, culturally, the United States and Latin America are more similar than the United States is with other emerging <coughs> markets. And more importantly, the Americas, or at least the continental Americas, is a region that is mostly democratic, almost wholly democratic. So we have a, a deep connection there. But at a time when the United States needs new ties with emerging markets, and particularly, I would argue, with Latin America. US influence in Latin America has never been lower, ever. Why? I think the main reason is because the United States voluntarily withdrew from Latin America, diplomatically speaking, after 9-11. So, if you remember back, in the early days of the Bush administration, there were some efforts to reach out and reset, re-establish a firm relationship, particularly with Mexico. But, of course, 9-11 changed that, and the focus moved to fighting, you know, this fire-breathing, violent Islam, and Latin America dropped down a long list of foreign policy priorities in the State Department, and it's pretty much remained down at the bottom of that list uh, ever since. And so this creates a vacuum. And into that vacuum come other countries, principally China, but also Russia, and also Iran. And these countries are interested in the natural resources in the, in the oil and the metals and the, and the grains, the agricultural products that Latin America pumps out. But they're also interested in establishing a foothold in a region that Washington traditionally thought of as its backyard. Uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski is, is touting a book at the moment, and I heard him talk about how um, America's strategic isolation is only matched by China's strategic patience. Well, if you want to see an example of that, look at Latin America. I talked about how uh, Latin American, uh, uh, sorry, about how American corporations had been investing in emerging markets. And it's produced a very interesting trend uh, in the trade flows uh, between North America and Latin America. So uh, if you look at the data, you'll see that in 1990, the U.S. exported a little under 14% of its exports to Latin America. By 2010, that had risen to 24%. So a quarter of U.S. exports, significant increase. If you look at Latin American exports to the U.S., they go in the opposite direction. So in 1990, the US, uh, Latin America is exporting 48% of its exports to the US, and that's fallen by 2010 to 40%. What do we learn from that? Well, the United States, in crude terms, the United States is becoming more dependent on Latin America at the very time that Latin America is becoming less dependent on the United States. Latin America, very sensibly, is looking at, at, at these changes in the global economy and retilting its society, its politics, and its economy accordingly. So if you take those same data 
and look at what happened with China. Less than 1% of Latin American exports went to China in 1990. By 2010, 10% of Latin American exports went to China. Explosive growth. China, not the US, is now the top trading partner of Brazil, of Chile, and of Peru. And the United States' withdrawal from the region has enabled that. So that's my first explanation. My second explanation for why US influence is at an all-time low relates to what I saw when I was there and what I mentioned earlier. There's been a growth of a radical, nationalist, leftist uh, movement in Latin America that is, at its heart, very anti-American. I'm talking here about Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, about uh, Evo Morales in Bolivia, about uh, Rafael Correa in Ecuador, <coughs> and other allies. I mean, you, uh, from time to time, you could put Argentina in that group too. And Nicaragua, Cuba, of course. And these leaders really emerged in reaction to the Washington Consensus. As I'm sure you know, in the 1980s and 1990s, the US backed efforts by the multilaterals, the IMF, the World Bank, to open up the economies of Latin America. And in South America, it was done very aggressively. In countries like Bolivia, I mean, Bolivia was the laboratory for the Washington Consensus. This, that meant a lot of privatizations. It meant getting the state out of the economy and making the country as attractive as possible to foreign investors offering low tax rates, special benefits, whatever it was. The problem was, it didn't quite work. And so, between, at least not in the short term, let's say that, let's be fair. So between 1998 and 2003, you have what people call a lost half decade. And the economy completely stagnated. Latin America only really started to grow in 2004. And the reason for that was because the commodities that Latin America sells, all this oil, these metals, these agricultural products, the prices for those took off and have pretty much been rising ever since because of the rapid industrialization of China and India. And there was an interesting reaction to this in Latin America. In previous booms, much of the profits from extracting raw materials had really gone to foreign corporations and been spirited away and hadn't really benefited the country. Or in some, in some occurrences, it had gone to corrupt leaders. The point is it hadn't gone to development. So there was a groundswell of demand that this time we're not going to miss out. This time we want more control over the economy. We want more control over these natural resources that are being removed from our land. And the old orthodoxy, the orthodoxy of the Washington Consensus, was that the most important thing you could do was get out of the way of the economy and to bring in foreign corporations. And these leaders didn't care about that. They did entirely the opposite. They nationalized industries. They put up uh, taxes on foreign investors. They insisted that they uh, in, uh, engage in joint ventures if they wanted to exploit natural resources and all the rest of it. And the other reason that these leaders were popular and were able to gain power, of course, is because since the 1830s of the Monroe Doctrine, there was a strong strain, there is a strong strain of anti-Americanism in Latin America, with good reason. I mean, let's not forget the dirty wars and the coups and the assassinations and all the rest of it. So this history of anti-Americanism combined with this anti-free marketeering to form a very heady, populist brew. Now, South America, I'm sure you've heard many times, is often described uh, as having two lefts, two left-wing camps. <coughs> the first is, uh, is the radicals that I talked about, so Venezuela, Bolivia, Ecuador. And the second is usually taken to mean Brazil. So the implication here is that Brazil are kind of the good guys, and the Venezuelans and their, their, their friends are the bad guys. That's a very common analysis. 
that I'm sure you've seen. But I think once you strip away some of the rhetoric that you get, and you get a lot of rhetoric <laughs> from Chavez and friends, when you strip that away and look at what they're actually doing, what it amounts to is, is resource nationalism or economic nationalism. Essentially, getting the state back into the economy and taking greater control uh, over state companies and using them for political ends, whether it's uh, trying to bring down poverty rates or increase social spending or whatever it is. And to my mind, economic nationalism of that sort has been on display in Brasilia as well as in Caracas and La Paz and Quito. I'll give you a couple of quick examples. In 2010, uh, Brazil um, issued a massive share offering in Petrobras, the state oil company. $67 billion worth of shares, the biggest share offering in history. Which is another indication, by the way, of how important Latin America is to the global financial system. Um, now, the state always retained control over Petrobras. But in this share offering, they structured it cleverly so that the state would take greater capital control over Petrobras. They increased their capital share from 40% to 48%. That's an economically nationalist thing to do. And they're not afraid, the Brazilians are not afraid of using their power over Petrobras to force it to make decisions. So right now, for example, they are telling Petrobras they've got to use local contractors for, to buy equipment or whatever. Even though there's some doubt about whether those local contractors are any good. The second example is, came last year, in 2011, under the presidency of Dilma Rousseff, who's often thought of as, as more moderate than Lula, her predecessor. I, I disagree. I mean, at least in this sense, at least in the economic sense, I don't think that's accurate. Um, under Dilma, uh, the Brazilian government forced out the head of Vale. I'm sure you're familiar with Vale. It's the world's second biggest mining company. It's based in Brazil, and the head of it is a guy called Rod, was a guy called Roger Agnelli, very respected in business circles, who laid out a cost-cutting plan. Not a very good idea for for a company that's effectively controlled by the state, and he was forced out. Actually, Vale is a private company, but. Um, but their share, the biggest shareholder is the public pension funds, so they're effectively a uh, state-controlled company. And there are other examples. In fact, if you look at the, uh, the, the Brazilian stock market, 38%, 38% of the Brazilian stock market is accounted for by state-owned companies. So to my mind, the idea that economic nationalism only belongs to the radical left is, is just not true. Most of Latin America is controlled by governments that do not believe anymore in the ideas of the Washington Consensus, but believe in uh, economic nationalism, in the state taking greater control uh, over the economy. Now in 2005, 2006, when these left-wing nationalist governments were elected, and I was reporting about them, there was a widespread assumption, not just in the US, but pretty much everywhere among mainstream Latin America watchers, that they would either collapse pretty quickly, or that they would have to moderate themselves. Because the orthodoxy was that the best thing you could do was to bring in foreign investors. So the idea that you would squeeze foreign investors, you would nationalize industries, kick out foreign investors, there's no way that would, that, that would work. You, you, the logic was, the logic of globalization meant that that had to fail. Well, unfortunately, the logic wasn't quite right because it hasn't failed. I mean, those leaders didn't moderate. They haven't yet collapsed. Of course, I can say that now. Maybe they'll collapse tomorrow. But at the time of speaking, they haven't yet collapsed. And not only that, but it hasn't been all bad. I mean, they have managed to bring down poverty rates. Maybe the cost is high, but the, nevertheless, that's what they wanted to achieve, and they've achieved it. The, at the same time, there's a much bigger event going on in the world, which is that there's a questioning of the whole economic system that we live under. I mean, one of the, the principal ob objections made about Chavez's Venezuela is that it was, it's unsustainable. So people may be sympathetic, but it's unsustainable. To my mind, the financial crisis 
meant that everything was unsustainable. I mean, is the Eurozone sustainable? What was the over-the-counter derivatives market that gave us the, uh, the credit default swaps and the collateralized debt obligations? Was that sustainable? Is the US debt sustainable? The, the, the economic system that we live under is being questioned like never before. And I'm not just talking about the Occupy movement, although that's a part of it. But if you look at polls, people are deeply skeptical about the system that we live under. Get this, the Financial Times is running a series called Capitalism in Crisis. Wow. I mean, 10 years ago, you'd have to read a Marxist publication to read a series called Capitalism in Crisis, not the FT. And at the same time, there's been a growth in a different kind of model. A lot of people call it state capitalism. There's a big report in The Economist last week about this very subject. We were told in the kind of end of history days of Francis Fukuyama that there was only one way to develop. That was the Washington Consensus idea. There was no other way. You might not like it, but you can't, the state can't be involved in the economy. You have to let you know, free markets t take their course. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't develop otherwise. That was the only path to development. Well, the Chinese and the Russians and Middle Eastern countries didn't see it that way. They have made state capitalism work. They've essentially directed their development uh, with the use of the state, the state controlling the economy. So some good nuggets in that Economist report, I really recommend reading it. The 13 biggest oil companies in the world are all state-owned. They control three quarters of the world's oil reserves. And not to mention that there are state-owned companies that are, you know, banks, and airlines and manufacturers and the list goes on and on. So there is a different model out there. The debate that's going to be had in America about the role of the government in the economy, this is an international debate. And it's not clear that the free marketeers are winning the debate. So what should the United States do? Let's talk about some practical policy issues. It needs to re-establish uh, good ties with Latin American countries. It doesn't have very much money to do that, right? We're talking about a cash-strapped superpower. Well, to my mind, a good place to start would be to undo some of the things that America's been doing. Um, if you look at US foreign policy, it is a hell of a model when it comes to Latin America. Uh, bits from the Cold War, bits from you know, the war on terror, cobbled together, incoherent, unsatisfying, bit of a mess. <clears throat> so let's start by undoing some other things we've been doing. Here's my initial checklist, one, two, three. The Cuba embargo has failed. It was aimed at unseating the Castro regime, and after 50 years, you know, maybe it's time to reassess whether that really worked. Uh, number two, the war on drugs. You know, I could almost say ditto. Uh, it's, it's not so old. It's from the 80s, essentially. The war on drugs. I mean, fortunately, America is now admitting that demand has some role in bringing drugs, you know, from narcotics from Latin America to North America. That's, that's a good start. But, um, you know, the war on drugs hasn't stopped the flow of drugs into, into the United States hasn't brought down the, the cost of drugs. And look at the price. 50,000 people have been killed in Mexico in the past six years in drug-related uh, violence. And number three will also be no surprise to you, uh, immigration. The United States desperately needs comprehensive immigration reform. Why shouldn't it do that? Why shouldn't it develop that reform in partnership with the very countries where the migrants are coming from? 
I mean, if you want to stop people coming from Latin America, you need to talk to Latin America. You need to help Latin America develop. You can't just, you know, close the door and, and, and shut it with a key and pretend that people won't climb up and under and whatever. So that's my kind of, let's get to a level playing field. Let's get to where we want to be, where we want to start from. You know that old joke about, you know, how do you get to whatever? Well, I wouldn't start from here. Well, I wouldn't start from here, but I would start from there. I would start from getting rid of the war on drugs, the Cuba embargo, and comprehensive immigration reform. But beyond that, the United States really needs to build good, solid ties with Latin American countries. Not the old style of ties where you tell them what to do, but a real partnership. You know, think more... Uh, European Union than the kind of old school US foreign policy. And critical to this uh, is Brazil. The relationship with Brazil is, is absolutely central for the United States. I mean, Brazil recently became the sixth biggest uh, economy in the world. And as I said, uh, it's forecast by 2050 to overtake Russia and Japan and become the fourth biggest economy in the world. Uh, why wouldn't you want to shackle your economy to theirs? That is the most natural partnership for the United States in the world. Now, as I'm sure you know, Brazil, um, although it's achieved tremendous amount economically, first, it has a lot of problems still, but second, it has political ambitions that have never been realized, and it's extremely frustrating to the Brazilians. With, with, I mean, they, they have a very good case. I'll give you an example. They're the sixth biggest economy in the world. Are they in the G8? I mean, six is within eight. <laughs> they ain't there. They're not there. So they've been completely overlooked by the G8. They are desperate to have a seat on the UN Security Council. As are other emerging economies, right? Like India. Uh, Barack Obama has backed India for a seat on the UN Security Council. A permanent seat, I'm talking. Why hasn't he backed Brazil? He refuses to back Brazil for a permanent seat on the UN Security Council. <coughs> to my mind, Brazil is a much more important strategic partner than India. I'm not saying that India is not important, of course it is. But if you're looking at strategically in that way that Brzezinski talks, you have to look at Brazil. It's critical. I think that is a big mistake. It indicates to me the kind of foreign policy shift that needs to go on in Washington if the US is to take advantage of this <coughs> proximity to such an important emerging market. The US should be advocating for a seat for Brazil on the UN Security Council. It should be advocating to either disband the G8 and replace it with G20, which is a much more important organization anyway, or at least enlarge the G8 to better reflect yeah the changes that have taken place in the world economy. The US and Latin America have a huge amount in common. I mean, concern, policy concerns in common. Energy security. I haven't even mentioned the fact that Latin America is a bigger source of US oil imports than the Middle East. Do you want to talk to them about energy security? And what about crime? We talk about the, the war on drugs, but, but crime in general is an issue that's, that transcends this artificial border between Latin America and the United States. Education, climate change, human trafficking. There are lots of issues uh, that, that we have in common, where the United States could forge a common agenda. But it isn't going to be able to do that with the old school style of telling people what to do. The US has to listen, and it has to, at some point, seed ground. The United States has to get used to working with countries it doesn't always agree with. I mean, the State Department's got used to doing that elsewhere, China being a good example, Saudi Arabia. Latin America is, is, is the place to start putting that policy into effect. As I've argued, not just because uh, it's an important trading partner, but because it's important for the US in the world. I don't think it's too late, but I do think it's very urgent that the US re-engage, rethink 
develop a new strategy for engaging and building ties and partnerships with Latin America. Not for the sake of Latin America, but for its own sake. Thank you very much. I'll be pleased to take questions. Isn't that a fascinating phenomenon? So we're going to ask Latin Americans for work. <laughs> Amazing. I mean, the other thing I didn't mention is, uh, that relates to what you just said. Thank you for that quest great question. Is, uh, you know, Christine Lagarde, the head of the IMF, was in Latin America recently, begging them for money to help save Europe. <laughs> the irony. Um, it's a very, I saw the article myself, a very interesting phenomenon. I don't, I don't know if, if the US is in the same, you know, is in the same position. Um, but I mean, it certainly shows you, it, it, the thing that, that I find remarkable about these kind of stories is, you know, you hear, as I said in the presentation, you hear about America being in decline and the emerging markets rising. But sometimes you, you get a, it's such a potent example that really strikes you in the face. That is one of those, right? People leaving Europe to go and work in Brazil to get jobs or, 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 or your idea of the US asking Brazil uh, for jobs. Fascinating. Who knows? I mean, that... Who knows what may happen in the future? I don't think we're quite there yet. You've spoken about the growth of the, say, Brazil and maybe Russia and other emerging markets. How much of that is really natural resources? And just exploitation of natural resources, as far as the wealth and the GDP is concerned. Yeah, thank you for that question. That's an excellent point. I mean, a lot of it is, and, and when I mentioned those, ch the changing um, trade time, uh, the change in exports with, with China, much of that is accounted for by, for by by natural resources. I mean, as I'm sure you know, China, outside Asia, really targeted Latin America as a place for foreign investment. And in fact, it's their top location outside Asia for foreign investment. Um, a lot of it is a natural resources. And so the big question that's being asked right now is how sustainable, again, back to the question of sustainability, how sustainable is that? I mean, China is slowing down, still growing, but the growth is slowing. Um, and so the question is, <coughs> Latin America, actually, to go back to the gen earlier gentleman's question, Latin America is very uh, little exposed to Europe. It's only about 2% of Latin America's GDP that depends on Europe, but it's become very heavily exposed to China particularly South America. So much of this does depend on China, and there's a great concern in the region about Chinese slowdown. But here's my observation about that. Let's imagine that China doesn't slow to 8%, or whatever people are projecting, but slows to 3%. It's not only Latin America that's going to be in trouble. We're all going to be in trouble. You know, if the second biggest economy in the world <coughs> slows down significantly, we're all going to be hit. I mean, that will ricochet back to the US, back to Europe. Uh, God knows what that would do to Europe. But I mean, it, the, 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 uh, the idea that Latin America um, is the only continent that's exposed to, Chinese, to the Chinese economy is, is just a nonsense. Sometimes you see it written that way. Uh, it is exposed. It is very dependent on natural resources. So uh, there's a big question in Latin America about how to diversify development. Uh, something I, I didn't mention, but uh, I talk about in the book, is, that, is the relationship between Brazil and China. There is a kind of love-hate relationship between Latin American countries and China. Um, on the one hand, they're delighted for the investment and for the market. On the other hand, they're being flooded with cheap Chinese goods. That has undermined a lot of their manufacturing. So in Brazil, like shoe manufacturing, that kind of thing has really been, the toy manufacturing has really been hurt by cheap Chinese imports. And actually, I think 
that Brazil, I think I'm right in saying that Brazil has the largest number of anti-dumping complaints at the WTO against China of any country in the world. So that is a big concern in Latin America. At the same time, if you believe the analysts who say we're in a super cycle, where else would you go? I mean, that is where the demand for natural resources is going to be. So the best thing, I mean, it's kind of like money spitting out of the ATM. You know, at some point it's going to stop. But are you going to walk away? <laughs> you know, I, I think it's very natural for Latin America to take advantage of that. It, will, it, will, this, will the same be true in 50 years' time? Probably not. But by then, these will be problems of growth. You know, Latin America, um, in much the same way as the U.S. You know, the U.S., the whole Occupy movement is about... When we start growing again, how are we going to distribute the wealth? That's how I understand it anyway. I mean, that's the serious aspect of Occupy. Um, Latin America's been talking about that for a few years now. And these debates between the more radical left and the softer left are really about how do we uh, direct this, this windfall to make sure that we don't have uh, problems of, uh, we have fewer problems of poverty and inequality. I hope that answers your question. You have uh, opined that uh, we should be pressing to go ahead in Latin America with joint development. Do you sense that Brazil would like to do that as a leader in Latin America as well? Those are their competitor of ours and all the other Latin American countries. Thank you for the question. That's an excellent point. Um, there is that danger. I think that the, if, the U, if the U.S. doesn't re-engage Latin America, that is inevitable. Um, and the fact that the US, U.S. history in Latin America has generally been so bad, right, then there is a, a, a latent anti-Americanism. Having said that, something very interesting happened. Do you remember this, uh, the coup, or non-coup, whatever you want to call it, that happened in Honduras a couple of years ago? So um, the United States initially said it was a coup, then said they weren't so sure about whether it was a coup or not. And it emerged that there was kind of a split between the United States and Brazil. And um, the reason I mention it not because of Brazil, but because uh, Chavez said on his TV show said, "Obama, do something," which was fascinating. You know, the, the, the very guy who's telling Americans to keep their hands off at the moment of crisis says, "Do something." So I think there is, uh, although there's a kind of latent anti-Americanism, there is a desire to um, to have a relationship with the United States, a better relationship. Certainly when Barack Obama was first elected, there was, a, there was definitely a change in tone everywhere. I mean, remember, he shook Chavez's hand or whatever. I mean, there, there, was some, there was a change there. I think things have slipped a bit because people saw that the Americans really weren't that concerned. Um, and as I said, when Obama went to Brazil, there was a sense that he might back Brazil for a UN Security Council seat, and he didn't there was kind of a disappointment. The other thing I would mention to you is, um, that I'm sure you remember, is, in, is uh, in 2010, Brazil and uh, Turkey came up with a plan to negotiate with Tehran <coughs> over nuclear weapons, over nuclear capability, sorry, to give, um, uh, I think the deal was to give uh, Iran uh, enriched uranium for uh, civil development. And this was infuriated Hillary Clinton uh, because she'd been working on sanctions separately. And, you know, very interesting question. Turkey, it's obvious why they want to do, deal with Iran. They, they, half of their oil imports come from Iran. What about Brazil? I mean, why would they care about, really, about Iran? Well, the reason they care is because they want to be a global player. If the United States could somehow harness that and work with them, back them, in the book I recommend forming an American G5, or G4, whatever it is, but essentially to get together Canada, the United States, Mexico, and Brazil, and maybe Argentina, to try and thrash out issues that, that will be relevant in, for, in forums like the G20 or the United Nations. It, a change in attitude, I think, could go a long way towards repairing that relationship. And if the United States were to back, enthusiastically back Brazil, I think that would work wonders. But there is that danger. I have a question about Europe. Um, in the second half of last year, it seemed whenever they sneezed, the United States thought they were dying from pneumonia. And the Dow was up 300, it was down 300, like every other day. I mean, it was giving everybody angst. 
you know. So this month, it seems like things are still not good over there, but the Dow is going down, but it's recovering in the same day. And they're, are they shrugging it off, or are they just used to it, or what's happened? You're not actually asking me to explain the stock market. You know? no, no. <laughs> I hope not. Um, well, I mean, to me, the remarkable thing about Europe is the pathetic inability of European leaders to seize control of the situation. So we've seen a succession of attempts of them saying, oh, we've got this fund. Market rallies. Then the next day someone realizes, yeah, but there's no money in the fund. The market falls. You know, we've got this solution. Somebody realizes there's a big hole in the solution. And the market falls. Um, I mean... It's very, it's very depressing what's going on in Europe. I think it's a real failure of governance. Um, to some extent, I mean, my paper is, is supportive but skeptical of, of, uh, of, the, of the Eurozone. I think to some extent, these tensions that were inherent in the system have to be fixed. Um, but, uh, I mean, it does indicate to you, you know, if you think back 20, 25 years ago, the US stock market would not have reacted like that to a crisis in Europe. It, it shows you how related we all are. Brazil, the GDP was, uh, the G Brazil went into a slight, uh, not recession, but it contracted in the third quarter of last year. These things have an impact, and people are plugging that into their models. Uh, the high frequency traders and whoever else are plugging that in. These are important pieces of information. So you can't anymore. Retra uh, you know, retrench into your own economy and say, well, we just concentrate on growth, the sort of Ron Paul response. We're all connected. And, uh, you know, the more, the, 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 the more, as history rolls out, the lesson is that we're very much connected. That's exactly the argument I'm trying to make, that, you know, if you look, if America looks 50 years in the future, who, you know, what, 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 are, what are the chess moves you need to make to get to wherever you want to be? And I think an important one is right here in, 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 in the Americas. How, how about we take two, one or two questions? Yeah, sorry, I was just kind of. Before we wrap up. I got, you know, I used to swim in this direction. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Do you see a good economic model of any place in the globe for the extraction of minerals? And when I say good, I mean a host country develops an infrastructure and they receive some of the benefits. And the mineral rights aren't simply given away. The product. I'm thinking, for example, I have read that in Venezuela, the Chinese do not purchase Venezuelan oil. They insist upon doing the, um, the exploration themselves and getting it out themselves. Do you see a good model in some place in the world for uh, mineral extraction? That's a great question. I mean, it's, it's uh, yeah, the question was is there a good model in the world for extracting minerals? I mean, you know, we all know about Dutch disease and the kind of the resource curse, right? In Venezuela, they, they said that, that uh, oil was the devil's excrement, right? Because, uh, you know, it, it always ends up badly with oil. Um, there, there have been uh, very few examples of what you talk about. I think maybe rather than Venezuela, you know, which has, let's face it, I mean, I defend Venezuela a little bit, but it has a huge amount of problems. I mean, it's corrupt, it's inefficient. Um, but look at Brazil. I mean, Brazil maybe has the potential. You know, they've discovered these large deposits. Now they're having some problems getting them out. But the thing that people always point to in term, development terms in Brazil is Bolsa Familia, right? Which I'm sure you, you're aware of, the, the program of giving to low-income families uh, a handout. It's a program that's been copied of, um, in Bolivia by, by the Morales administration. Um, so essentially, you know, uh, the way it works in Bolivia, for example, is if you send your kids to school, you get a payment uh, for low-income families. Um, now, in Brazil, they have, uh, I believe they've demanded that all the um, extraction from the pre-sal deposits, uh, those uh, offshore deposits, are going to be joint ventures with the government. And the, the fascinating thing about it... Uh, is you know when I was in when I was in Bolivia in 2006 and they nationalised the gas industry, all the ga all the energy companies were calling me saying right that's it you know we're out, you know we're serious this we really are serious, and of course you know some of them did leave but many of them didn't and I, you know occasionally you see an item 
if you ever read uh, like Platts or you know those energy magazines, they'll say you know just quite at the bottom of page 17 in the corner, it will say you know BP has agreed a new deal with the Bolivian government. You know it's all very quiet, but they're creeping back in. You get some of that as well in Venezuela. Um, but to answer your question, I, I I think we're still in the in the in the stage of developing the models. Um, something I should have said though. The idea that there's one model for anything, for development, for the economy, for, for managing your natural resources, is just a very old-fashioned way of thinking. You know, when we start thinking, you know, it's a bit like sort of medieval Christianity. You know, we don't want to start thinking that there's one way of doing things. There are going to be different models of development. That's a good thing. You know, each country is, uh, has its own problems. Uh, oil has generally been more of a curse than a blessing. But... Um, uh, it hasn't necessarily been more of a blessing when you bring in foreign oil companies than you have state oil companies. So um, uh, I think the important thing is to try to encourage countries that have resources um, to make sure that they spend them uh, on development and to try and measure that in some way. You know, that, that's something that people are trying to do, for example, in, in Nigeria, you know, which is, has its own problems, as I'm sure you know. Yes, sir. As the result of the war in Iraq, would you argue that the U.S. government has injected more money into our economy or into their economy? As a result of the war in Iraq, I'm not sure I understand the question. Has the U.S. government injected more money into U.S. economy or? Or just siphoned it off up to abroad, to other wow. countries. Wow, I'm not sure I'm qualified to answer that question. Um, I mean, I think certainly, to relate it back to Latin America, the, the the, um, there is a desire not to spend any money on foreign policy right, right now in America. I, I went to a fascinating talk by um, Enrique Capriles Rodotsky, the guy who may well be, we're going to find out in the next few days whether he'll be standing against Chavez in Venezuela. He came to Chicago to the um, Council on Global Affairs. And... Um, um, uh, you know, somebody uh, um, uh, asked him, what can we do to help you? The kind of anti-Chavez movement. He said, uh, great answer, he said, Venezuela's problems are going to be solved by Venezuela. And the crowd was enthusiastic, so enthusiastic, you know, they lapped it up. And to my mind, part of the reason is because that's free. <laughs> you don't have to spend any money to let Venezuela solve their own problems. All the, all the things that I outline are essentially free. You don't have to spend any money, doesn't it? It's, not, it's, a, it's a diplomatic foreign policy. In that sense, I do agree with Ron Paul, actually. I mean, I, at least he, what, he, what he says. Um, it's a diplomatic foreign policy, not a military foreign policy. It's not gumbo diplomacy, which is what America has often done. I, I, but I mean, to be honest with you, I cannot answer your question. I mean, I think it's an excellent question. I commend you for it, but... I would be lying if I said I knew the answer to that. A great question. I think we, we really only have time for one or, one or two quick, quick questions before we wrap up. <coughs> and what, is stopping North, <coughs> what is stopping North America from working together with South America in order to maximize the economic growth of both countries? And if you can answer that question, do you believe it can be done? Yes, well, I, repeat the question, please. The question was, what's, what's stopping North America uh, working more closely with, with, with South America and Latin America to promote economic growth in, in both regions? And do I believe it could be done? Well, I, I, mean, I think I said it can definitely be done. Uh, I outlined some ways I think it can be, the U.S. can start. Um, I think what's holding the U.S. back, uh, to be honest, I think that America's very distracted. It doesn't have a very, and that's uh, Brzezinski's point, right? It doesn't have a very strategic foreign policy. I think it's time for America to stop thinking ideologically and start thinking pragmatically. As I said, you know, where do we actually want to go to? How do we get there? To my mind, the road to America's future role goes through Latin America. That's a really good question. So, uh, did everyone hear that? Um, 
Let's not forget that much of the instability has been caused by U.S. foreign policy from time to time, like Chile in the 70s, etc. But um, the fascinating thing actually that's happened in Latin America is, um, is there is tremendous political stability. So when Rafael Correa, for example, was elected in, in Ecuador, people assumed, because Ecuadorian governments normally last about 18 months, that he would soon you know, be off to Miami, or Illinois, actually, he's a graduate of the University of Illinois. Um, but uh, he's still in power, amazing. And the same in Bolivia. Actually, it's tremendous political stability that you've seen. Look at Brazil. The Workers' Party won power after how many decades of being shut out. And they handed over, uh, Lula handed over power to his designated successor. So actually, I think what you've seen in, in, in Latin America is tremendous uh, continuity. But do you think the Americans believe it? Oh, I see, do I think, well, I mean, <laughs> That's a whole other question. I mean, I think if you, in terms of political stability, there's probably never been a better time than now. I mean, the region is democratic. There's a, there's a poll that comes out every year um, that's published in The Economist first called Latino Barometro, which is a fascinating um, uh, poll about attitudes to democracy and development across Latin America. And they usually show that people are pretty, they, they grumble about things, you know, they're usually up, upset about something. So you often get about a fifth of the population saying, you know, I would have a military government if things were more, you know, if things were more stable. But actually, when it comes down to it, most people believe in democracy. They believe that the democratic wave that swept across Latin America in the 70s and 80s uh, has been beneficial. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's an incredible thing, as I said in the presentation, that you have this huge emerging economy that is wholly democratic sitting on your doorstep. So it's a fantastic uh, opportunity. If the State Department doesn't know about it, I don't know where they got their heads. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Howard. Thank you, Howard, for that excellent presentation. Hal will be joining us for a while to, set, to sign his book, Latin Lessons. So please stay on for a little bit. Um, we'll have to add a G4 to our student programs because we do a G20. I like that G4 idea. Thank you for joining us. Best of luck to you and see you soon. Okay.